So I'll do that again. I'd like to call this meeting to order. It's Tuesday, November 16th of 2021, the regular council meeting. And uh, we go to 2.1, adoption of agenda. Does anyone have any I'll item? Do that again. I'd like to call this meeting to order. It's Tuesday, November 16th of 2021. Our audio is working great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> the adoption of the agenda. Does anyone have any items to add to the agenda? We do have a 4.14.1 council CAO dialogue added um, to the agenda. Is there any other items to add? Could I have a motion then, please? I'll make a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. All in favor? And that's carried. So this afternoon, I'm pleased to have Kimberly Worthington from CAPE, Central Alberta Economic Partnership, here as a delegation. And welcome. Oh, that's why you have... Is this for me to push so yeah, that you can wipe it off? Mind. Okay. James is on the line. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, and everybody has the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So thank you so much, uh, Your Worship and Council, for having us here today. Uh, in person, I have uh, the newly elected Mayor Megan Hansen from the town of Sylvan Lake and currently a board member of CAPE. And we also have uh, Mr. James Carpenter, who is the business representative for the town of Olds and sits on the board of CAPE as well. So I'll, uh, I'll start the presentation. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to put my glasses on. Uh, and we're just going to take a look at uh, Alberta Regional Economic Development Alliances overall. For those of you that are new, I'll give you Kim's quick cold, Cole's Notes version on, uh, on the, uh, the development of the RITAs. Then we'll go into Central Alberta Economic Partnership, locally known as CAPE, uh, membership levels, because we have associate members and municipal members, the value of municipal membership. Um, and then I love analogies, and then we'll finish up with any questions that you might have. Okay. So back in 1998, uh, the Regional Economic Development Alliances came into being. It was the brainchild of Mayor Gail, Mayor Gail from the city of Red Deer. Um, and uh, she felt that the city of Red Deer had an onus to the outlying communities because the outlying communities, as you all probably do, go into Red Deer and support their businesses at times. And probably some of your constituents go into Red Deer to work as well. So she thought all these outlying communities are supporting us. We need to support them as well. So she came up with this idea of regional economic development collaboration back in 1998. So then she went to the government of Alberta and said, hey, I have this great idea. Uh, what do you think? And they said, hmm, okay, let's pilot it. And CAPE became an entity. Prior to that, we were known as CABIN. And please don't ask me to tell you what that stands for, but I can tell you the first two letters would be Central Alberta, something like a business program. And then CAPE evolved out of that. So. CAPE came into being not because of any one project, but it came into being because um, the region ought to play together. Now, I can tell you back in 1998, this was a rather novel idea. Um, I did some research in the early 2000s about regional collaboration and how small communities could play in the global economy. And although I was very successful in my research and it showed that small communities could play, albeit to varying degrees, I was mocked and laughed at like really, like the city of Coquitlam could participate in the global economy. They're not a world-class city. They're not in New York. They're not in Tokyo. Sorry guys, sorry council, but neither is Rocky Mountain House. But how do you play together and bring businesses and support your businesses in Rocky Mountain House and your small surrounding area as so you work together? So fast forward um, to 2011. Um, and during those 10, 11, 12 years, um, 
the RITAs were managed by government employees. So Donna Lard, some of you would know her, she was the Kimberly of that day. So she managed, they had administrative support, they had offices and they had project support. In 2011, the government of the day said, hmm, I'm gonna kick you out of the trough. That's something my uncle said about my cousins when they were done university, they were out of the trough, they had to go and fend for themselves. So we did that, we got our offices, we got new executive directors, um, that was somebody before me um, and carried on. Not everybody survived that. The Grand Alberta Economic Region, for example, that's Hinton, Jasper, Edson, Yellowhead County, um, they chose to dissolve. I was working in that area at that time and part of that decision-making process. Um, but many of us carried, many of the readers carried on. So then fast forward to 2015, we signed an MOU with the government of Alberta for five years of operational funds. Again, in 2015, with the change of the government, uh, they doubled our funding. So not only did we have operational funds, but we had project funds as well. And then fast forward to 2020, 2020 um, like many organizations, uh, unfortunately we got our funding cut in half. So we are managing just fine. Um, you know, like many organizations, we're taking advantage of a uh, number of different subsidies that are out there as a result of COVID. Um, and we have been very successful in some grants as well. So we continue to carry on with about a half a million dollar budget, um, which hasn't deviated from, from anything else. Um, so we continue to work with the government. We continue to be a connector and James will talk about that in a little bit. Um, but our mandate with the government uh, is to lead collaborative regional economic development in action, uh, to build capacity in communities um, in terms of business retention, investment attraction, and business expansion, and cultivate and foster collaborative partnerships to support strategic growth and economic sustainability of regions, communities, and business. So these are our Government of Alberta deliverables that align quite nicely with Rocky Mountain House, especially the tourism piece, um, COVID-19 recovery. Uh, every community is having trouble through COVID with retaining their businesses. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, as well as we'll talk about investment attraction readiness. So I didn't realize just how bilingual I was when I pulled up this slide, but there you go, I'm being a true Canadian. Um, so basically, what do we want to achieve? We want to be known across the country as an innovative and prosperous region that's collaborative. Why are we here? To empower our member municipalities to advance sustainable regional economic development at the local level. And how do we do that? We act strategically. We're a connector. We're a conduit and a facilitator of information and resources and relationships. And we provide tools, resources, training, and advocacy for members to build their economic development capacity. So on that, I'm happy to pass it over to James first to talk about being a connector. Um, and uh, then Megan, perhaps you'd like to share on the advocacy piece as well. Okay, James, can you? Perfect. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. What a privilege it is. I always get excited when I get to speak to a town council. For, first of all, congratulations on your reelection to everyone. And I wanna tell you, um, I actually haven't spent a lot of time in Rocky Mountain House other than my son played some football there. We've been through for different activities. But I do have one thing that's very pertinent to our conversation that I did attend in Rocky Mountain House just over three years ago. Just over three years ago, I actually uh, flew in uh, Quebec MPs, <clears throat> Quebec MPs who actually, <clears throat> pardon me, who actually toured the area and didn't understand oil and gas in Alberta. And I actually hosted them with Merv and Arlene uh, Perderny at uh, one of your local uh, hotels in town. And you say like, why did you bring in Quebec MPs? I brought in Quebec MPs because we have a gap between elected officials, municipalities, and obviously oil and gas in Alberta. And why do I tell you about this is because that's how I'm kind of wired is to bring people together. And part of my role on Cape and being as a community representative from the town of Olds, they put me on the board because I'm a connector. And I think that lots of times that we miss out on connecting with MLAs and members of parliament. 
And I wanted that day when I brought these Quebec MPs, I wanted the people of Rocky Mountain House, and the, it was full of businessmen and women, mostly oil patch. I wanted them to hear that I, there actually are people in Quebec that care about our oil and gas, and that they know that we need that oil and gas, not only just to heat our homes, but for economic benefit to all Canadians. And so as a member of CAPE and, and talking to you today, I want you to know that part of my personal mandate and challenge is connecting you with people that would vouch for me, including Minister Nixon, and other ministers and members of parliament and at a municipality level, bringing mayors and councillors together is part of my goal because we have to start working together because the bottom line is the rebuild of Alberta is gonna come through rural Alberta, through value added and technology in oil and gas and through agriculture. And I believe that Rocky Mountain House is really well positioned. So thank you for hearing me out. I'm a connector. I wanna keep the town of Rocky, Mount, Rocky Mountain House connected with all of Canada. Thank you, James. Megan, we were talking on the way in today um, about advocacy as well as the difference between associate and municipal membership. And Megan would like to share from an elected official's perspective um, her, her ideas of advocacy. Um, thanks, Megan. So in the town of Silver Lake, we believe, we believe the best way to do advocacy is amongst like people. So we have the best success when our elected officials are advocating other elected officials. We have the best success when our business owners are speaking to their fellow business owners. I think there's that built-in trust when you hold the same position. And the, the benefit we've really seen through CAPE is that this is now a group of elected, elected officials that are now getting together and speaking with a louder voice to other levels of government. I think we've, it's helped us push forward some conversations that on our own, just as mayor and council, I don't know that we would have been able to move them as far as we have. So yeah, that's really been a benefit to us to, to have that joint advocacy body. Thank you, Megan. So as I mentioned earlier, CAPE has two levels of membership. We have associate members um, and we have municipal members. This is a snapshot of our associate members for this year. And I'm happy to say that Campus Alberta Central, who I know is located here in Rocky Mountain House, is one of our associate members, as well as the Rocky Chamber. Um, you can see there's post-secondary institutions, uh, private enterprise, as well as other um, public entities. So as an associate member, like the Rocky Mountain Chamber of Commerce, uh, you have an opportunity to network, collaborate, get discounts on events and training, and can be an influencer. Uh, business has a great opportunity to influence elected officials. Um, and James, James has spoken to that. Um, and uh, the Chamber is a great influencer as well. So when we look at our municipal memberships, uh, we have... Um, 75 percent participating right now across the Cape region. There's about 40 municipalities. Um, we also have Montana First Nation and we've been in conversations with Ochi, Sunchild and Bighorn. Uh, Bighorn, we were actually out here in the summertime and uh, enjoyed a tour through the their backcountry area and boy it is so beautiful. Um, so this, uh, we had to update uh, the map. Uh, Currently on our website, there is two uh, members that, uh, no, two non-members on our map that we have been remiss in, in finding. Um, so I apologize for that, uh, but this is an accurate representation of our current members. And that's about 30 out of the 40. The, advances, the advantages of municipal membership, uh, the ability to shape the region by serving in working groups and committees, as well as on the board. As an elected official, if you are the municipal rep, you have an opportunity to run for the board. This December 1st, we're having our elections, and there's two positions coming available for towns. Um, also, if you appoint a business rep, and we just spoke to that at the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you have a potential um, to have two seats at the board, and then you really get to influence the region. Um, there's opportunities to network with all levels of government and business and community leaders at events. We just had an event on November 4th that both members and non-members were invited to uh, network with each other. We were celebrating municipal politics. Uh, we also had a number of uh, MPs there as well as uh, MLAs um, and the Speaker of the House. So there's great opportunity to network with higher levels of government um, and each other. There's the ability to leverage funding 
and grow economic vitality across the region. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the ability to build capacity within your own community and advance sustainable economic development and come with a louder voice with upper levels of government as we are all heard as one. Um, the mayor, the former mayor of Rosemary said it's like speaking through a megaphone. You can imagine that communities like Elnora or Caroline, they don't have a lot of uh, advocacy collateral. Um, so when they come together as one, the upper levels of government uh, definitely hear, hear them louder. So in terms of leveraging funding, the Cape Annual Budget, as I mentioned, is about $500,000. And that, you know that might, uh, we go back and forth between 30, 30 and 40,000 dollars on either side. Um, municipal contributions on average uh, are about 100,000 dollars. These numbers aren't perfect. I'm no mathematician. I will be the first to admit that. Um, but this makes it easy. And that's a five to one leverage with all the member municipalities funds coming together. I manage, Cape manages to leverage an additional $400,000 off of that $100,000, which goes towards projects, um, initiatives, training, events, etc. So Rocky Mountain House, with about a $4,000 commitment right now, I think your membership at 60 cents would be just under that, but then there's staff expenses and council expenses, etc. So it would be a little bit over that is 125 to one leverage. So for every $1 you spend, there's $125 that are coming, coming back to the region. Okay. I, and then just as a comparison, the city of Red Deer, their contribution is about $60,000. They're an eight to one leverage. So their leverage is a lot less, but they have no fewer opportunities. And you guys have no fewer opportunities either. I always hear the argument, well, it's all about Red Deer and Highway 2 corridor versus it's always about rural Alberta, right? Rural central Alberta. And none of that is accurate. We do the best that we can to ensure everybody has equal opportunity. Now, whether you take that opportunity or not is, isn't my choice. It isn't Cape's choice. It's up to you. Um, I was watching the Army of Thieves last night. Great movie, by the way. If, uh, if you haven't checked it out, it's well worth your time. And the safe cracker, he talked about, he was like, had an aha moment. And he said, you know, I get it now. You have to be engaged to understand how to crack that safe. You have to be engaged. It's the same thing with Cape. You have to be, the more you're engaged, and Megan can speak to this briefly, yeah. um, the more the more you're engaged, the more you get out of it. Do you want to speak to your yeah, experience? Probably eight years ago when, when I actually first got elected to the, or sat on the Cape board as a representative, I, we actually were in discussions with Sylvan Lake about, should we pull out of this? Is there value in this? And Quite frankly, the answer at that point was no, we weren't putting anything back into it. And that was certainly something that's on the table. Now, in recent years, we've decided let's actually step up and see if we can pull the value out of this. And we've seen that come back tenfold. Um, every bit of energy that we put in, now we're in the position where, you know, we have, a, I'm, I'm sitting on the board. My previous mayor was also a board member where we get opportunity to give that greater impact. We have a, a more powerful role in the advocacy that's played on it. And we certainly are getting our money's worth out of it, but um, that, that wasn't always our experience. So I certainly can, can understand that. Mm -hmm. And it, you, you'll get more face-to-face -face time with ministers as well from a regional perspective. Um, but, you know, facial recognition is a lot when you're at AUMA or RMA or at other events when there's a thousand other people that they may not recognize but you might be recognized because you've already been there. Um, networking and collaboration, that's one of the really key pieces. Um, and thanks for pointing that out, uh, uh, CAO Kraus in the, in the report, in the request for decision. Um, I appreciate that. I do have a funny YouTube video for you guys to watch, but I think I'll save it for the end because I'm cognizant of our time. Um, but it's, an, it's a joy to watch regardless. It has Mr. Bean in it and mm -hmm. it demonstrates collaboration and being big and small. You speak with a louder voice, uh, with a collaborative voice. We've talked about that already um, and the it advances the region's competitiveness. Um, I talked about that initially when I came in the room and that when we work together, we are more competitive. Um, and part of CAPE's uh, projects that we work on is municipal investment attraction readiness. Experts have identified when they've been in the region exploring it that central Alberta, generally speaking, is not investment already. So CAPE has been very proactive in creating a municipal investment attraction readiness program with a number of different projects in it. One of which I know that uh, 
the town of Rocky Mountain House has taken advantage of the community profile and has also been invited by Clearwater County to participate in another, another piece of that program too. And a big piece is building that local capacity. Um, you know, meeting with uh, regional economic development officers is great, but when elected officials and EDOs and business reps and industry all get to in the same room and they all get to talk together, it's a different dialogue. It's a different conversation than EDOs to EDOs because they think alike and elected officials think alike. But when you bring more perspectives to the table, um, it's a more robust dialogue. And in my opinion, you get more done and you come up with a better answer as well. So programs, projects, and participation. Uh, today, we have the Connections Corridor, um, Indigenous Nations Relations, the Central Alberta Workforce Strategies, the ABC Summit, uh, so on and so forth. So our strategic plan, 2016 to 2020, uh, because of COVID and not too sure where that was all going to go, we extended it to 2021. And now we're creating a regional economic growth strategy. So that's not just a strategy for CAPE. That's a strategy for the region. And we are engaging with as many people, many organizations, as many businesses as possible to come up with a direction that we can all pull in together. Uh, that is very different than what's CAPE doing. That's what's the region going to do and what's your role and what's your responsibility. Um, we're looking at executing on some of that next, next year, um, but drawing you back to one of your attachments in the uh, RFD is the, the survey that's back from 2016. So I just wanted to be clear on that. That hasn't happened in 2020, 2021. It's just titled that because the, it was part of the strategic plan for 2016 to 2020 that we, um, uh, that we extended into 2021 because of COVID. Um, I talked about the Municipal Investment Attraction Readiness Program. We're looking at expanding that into this year uh, and doing a business retention and expansion program. I've consulted with many EDOs and CAOs across the region that are members of CAPE to see what it is that they need and what they would like to see. Um, we're also doing a tourism asset assessment, thanks to CARES, uh, for industry expansion and diversification. I would love to see Rocky Mountain House involved in this um, as a member of CAPE. And we're going to implement some workforce strategies. Uh, as well, because we're working on um, that document right now. And we're actually, CAPE is just in the process of formalizing uh, a relationship with the Canadian Immigration Visa Services. And they are an organization, and James can help me out with this because he's much more eloquent and speaking about it than I am. Uh, they are an organization that works with international entrepreneurs that are looking to come to Canada. They're actually looking to come to Alberta and we're advocating for them to come to rural Alberta. So when you think about your businesses that are closing down, especially some of those because of COVID, some of them because the kids don't want to take it over and they don't have any succession plan, which I can guarantee you, lots of them don't have a succession plan. This is an opportunity to keep those businesses in your community rather than having empty buildings. James, do you want to add something to that? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Kimberly. So council, what's important to know is the Canadian uh, government has a program and they give so many certificates to each province. The province of Alberta has an allotment of up to 4,500 immigration certificates that they can grant to foreign people wanting to immigrate to Canada. The provincial government hasn't normally used it in Alberta because we've always had enough people and enough opportunity. So now the provincial government's gonna be, they've already announced, they're gonna have a program where they're gonna uh, initiate 500 certificates in rural Alberta. 500 opportunities for 500 families to come to Canada. Those families coming to Canada must buy or open a business, must employ local Albertans and create so many jobs and must have a financial wealth and have to be able to speak the language. And so Canadian Immigration Visa Services is one of these organizations that's really taken a keen interest in rural Alberta. What does that mean for members of CAPE? Well, for members of CAPE, we're listening and seeing what they've got going on, but this group has actually approached some of the communities within Cape and Rocky Mountain House is definitely on the list. And they'd like to open up a block of businesses and start pilot projects for the provincial government. As the provincial government announces the go forward, there will be opportunities and we'll connect you with these, uh, this company and other companies that are doing similar things for a block of businesses to potentially relocate to Rocky Mountain House, open up, become part of the community, 
go into our schools, use our facilities and grow the community. They'll be looking to buy existing businesses that are looking to retire and it'll actually help us maintain a value. As a business owner who has started over 25 companies, they call me a serial entrepreneur. The hardest thing for me to do is actually sell my business when I go to exit because who's going to buy a business in Didsbury, Sundry, Olds, Carstairs, Cremona? I have to find somebody and these people want to be here. Is that enough? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, so, so we have relationships like this and we continue to develop more and more relationships like this that will support your municipality, will support the surrounding area and will support the region and will support rural Alberta. Um, the connections corridor, you're all probably dying to hear about this. Um, you know, known as House Pass. However, we have not determined exactly what this is going to be yet. And I know that that can be a problem for some folks, for sure. But the reason why is we want to bring everybody to the table and we want everybody's values and perspective at the table as to what this could be. That means Rocky Mountain House, Clearwater County, Sylvan Lake, they're going to start twinning in 2022. I was just sent the article on that. And isn't that exciting? You know, it's going to be a much better road coming out to Rocky Mountain House and beyond and connecting into British Columbia. We've been in conversation with uh, CSRD local officials, elected officials, as well as their economic development officers, because their voice is critical at the table for this project to be a success. Um, the project, the proposed project concept, don't get me wrong, it's a concept at this point in time, is at the economic corridors task force table as well. And maybe your Highway 22 is there also. I'm not too sure whether it is or not, but it's being looked at very closely. The high, Highway 11 connections corridor is being looked at very closely by the government of Alberta economic corridors task force. And they're gonna send some recommendations up to the government of Alberta um, to see where they, they wanna put their efforts. Um, and I don't know what that looks like, unfortunately, but we've brought in ind indigenous nations, We've brought in municipalities, we've brought in business, we've brought in uh, EDOs, Indigenous nations, and elected officials on the BC side as well. And that's what's going to, all those people, all those parties together is going to define what this is going to be. We're going to look at, from the words of the Central Alberta Liaison on the Economic Corridors Task Force, we're going to look at what swath of land we can take to do this and figure out what can fit in there. So is it active transportation to support your, your pack? Um, tourism businesses, like your horse packing tourism businesses? Is it mountain biking? Is it a road? Is it a green road that vehicles charge on going through? Like the world is our oyster here. We can, we can figure it out within the parameters that we need, but we need everybody at the table to be successful with it. Um, and we stopped calling it house pass because it may not be totally house pass. It might be something on the left or something on the right. And we haven't fully defined it because uh, we're still developing those relationships with people that need to be at the table. Um, so I think Megan and James, James can talk a little bit about uh, business rep, but I am very cognizant of the time and I've probably gone over because I like to talk um, and I apologize for that. Uh, but otherwise, um, I am happy to open the floor to questions for any one of us. Absolutely. Please, I, just, Mayor. I just want to touch on um, the value portion of it. Just another consideration mm. for Sylvan Lake. So one of the, the projects that we jumped in on was the community profiles. And when we looked at doing this on our own, the cost to do this was like, I want to say four times higher. It was substantially higher than to do it through Cape. So that alone joining in on some of these projects that are underway that we have to do by ourself, if it wasn't for a partnership with CAPE, has saved us the cost of our of our membership. So we've certainly seen some financial savings as well when it comes to these are things we'd be likely looking to move forward with anyways, but but we're able to, to pull in those resources because you're working with a number of other communities to bring in the studies that we need or the profile that we need. So that's been another another bonus to us. But at the local level. Yes. At the local level. Yeah. So you bring up a, a good point there on value that I just wanted to touch on, because as you all know, um, costs are rising. Um, like they're looking at a, a 2.5 to 4% uh, cola increase um, in 2022. Uh, but aside from that, uh, CAPE has kept its membership levy at 40 cents forever. Um, and we've slowly upped that over the last five years, not wanting to be a burden on any one municipality. 
because although it may not be such a big deal for Rocky Mountain House or for the city of Red Deer, although they take the biggest hit um, for the region, it is a big deal for smaller communities. So in order to be fair, we went over five years with five cent increases. We are still below the consumer price index. We're still below all of the other Rita's. Um, I have a colleague down in South Bro, and they just went from 30 cents to a dollar bang like that for their, for their Rita costs. And we're looking at a 10 cent increase uh, each year over the next three years, up to 90 cents. We're still going to be the lowest priced Rita um, across the province. So the reason why is to, um, you know, improve our capacity. You know, it has been said many times uh, to me, limited capacity and too many initiatives to do anything good. It's kind of like a jack of all trades, but um, uh master of none. And uh, so we're changing that. We've hired additional staff to help with that. Um, it brings us in line with other Rita's. And of course, just the cost of paper, the cost of ink, the cost of computers, everything has gone up exponentially. So um, those are the reasons for our, um, for our increases. So thank you very much. Any questions? Do we, do we have any questions from council? Go ahead. Come. I guess I was looking at the presentation and a lot of it seems very uh, chamber of commerce-y. We already have a chamber of commerce. They work with all the other chambers of commerce. What makes Cape different from our chamber of commerce? Because it's $500 for the chamber of commerce to be a member and it's 5,000 and going up for a municipality. So wh where's that $4,500, I guess? You want to respond to that? Um, I, you can you can touch on the dollars and cents much more than I can, but I guess from our perspective, it's very different. Like I said, when it comes to the advocacy and the work that we do, the the business side of it tends to have better success when they're working with other businesses. The government side of it, when we're doing that mingling and and chatting and advocacy with other elected officials, is is much more beneficial to us. I don't actually see a lot of overlap in what our chamber membership and what our municipal membership offers, at least in Sylvan Lake. Um, the studies that have been beneficial to us and the other things that we've seen the benefit municipally aren't something that the chamber would be accessing. So I, I think there's a lot different level of service from our, from our perspective. Uh, yeah, it, not a lot of overlap in, in how we see it. The, the services that the Chamber of Commerce would access are very different from what we use on a municipal level. So as an associate member, the Chamber of Commerce uh, does not have access to um, <clears throat> the, the programs or the projects. So Mayor Megan was talking about the cost saving on the community profile, which Rocky Mountain House took advantage of, and they saved well over, um, well over their membership on leveraging CAPE. The Chamber of Commerce, as an associate member here, does not have that opportunity. So any of those projects that we're going in on a region to benefit the local communities, the Chamber of Commerce as an associate member at $500 a year does not have access to that. So the municipal, municipal and associate levels of membership are very, very different. Um, you know, they can help to build capacity within the own, their own community. But you guys, you guys are the community leaders. You are the elected community leaders. You have much more influence across your community to advance sustainable economic development. The chamber plays one role, absolutely. And we leverage our chambers to help with entrepreneurial development, business development, business supports, et cetera. Um, chamber of Commerce typically don't show up at uh, AMA or RMA, so they don't have that opportunity to network um, and have their faces known, as I talked about earlier, in terms of uh, getting in front of uh, ministers. They wouldn't be the ones to come with us to a minister's meeting. So a number of years ago uh, on Cape's 20th anniversary, I think we had eight, 10, 12 ministers in the room having dinner with the Cape board of, member, board of directors. You would have that opportunity as a Cape director, you would not have that opportunity as a chamber. So that's again, just an example of getting in the face of ministers, which is really key to your advocacy currency. Um, and you have a louder voice. It's it's your voice they're listening to. And chambers can absolutely influence your voice, but in the end, it's it's you guys who speak. I will speak to another example um, that just kind of I identified the other day. There's a different organization, and the Cape Board did require that 
both municipalities who support that organization be members of CAPE in order for that organization to be an associate member. Um, right now with the Rocky Chamber, and because it's a chamber, it's a different situation, but it's interesting when I look at the two because there's lots of similarities. So um, I, I can't say anything more, more than that, but it'll be, other than it'll be an interesting conversation at the, bo at the board. Um, so if, if the thought is, is that the chamber represents Rocky Mountain House equally at the Cape table, they don't, they don't have the opportunity to do so because they're at a different level of membership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Megan, I, I know we've talked a couple of times and I did talk to, to Sean before he became the CAO of uh, Red Deer. And so you were on council when he was the mayor and and I went to, I did the Zoom um, <laughs> meeting about the economic development for Cape as a uh, as a running, oh. like that Zoom one, there was, uh, I and Glenn Waiskowicz, um, he didn't, uh, get a position on, on on council but we talked afterwards and i was really excited about the initiative you did with taking 30 businesses can you talk just really quickly yes, about that certainly so that was the win this space mm -hmm. i think we were talking about um town of seven lake ran a contest in partnership with cape and a number of other organizations to help us come up with some of the prizing and some of the, the coaching. And we put out a call for businesses to say, you can win a year's worth of your lease or your rent in downtown Seven Lake, because that was a goal of ours to have new storefronts down there. If you basically win this contest. So it started out, there was over 30 applicants. I believe we had 30 that were allowed in the program. So we had to turn a few away. All of them went through a process that allowed them some business coaching, mm -hmm. helped them develop a business plan, come through the end. Then the five finalists did almost like a dragon's den type night, which was would have been way better in person, but it was it was fine virtually. And then the one finalist was chosen um, and they received a, a space. She's about to open up. But the neat thing through the process, the 30 businesses that went through five of them have now opened up. So we've seen way more benefit than what what the one winner was. And now we know these five businesses that have opened up aren't just opening up blindly and might have a great summer. They've gone through the process to have business coaching, to have a proper business plan and all of those types of things. So they're businesses that will be around next year as well, not just to get through the busy season. So yeah, it was it was a great contest for us. I hope we can do it again, um, maybe changing our format, but potentially next year, that's something that's at least part of budget discussions. It was what um, what um, uh, uh, role did uh, council like because you were on council at that time right. and the mayor do in that process? Um, we we supported it as a project and we provided some funding for it, but and and our economic development officer was the driver of it, but we actually didn't have that big of a role. I think it was important for us for at least the decision of the process to be outside of a political mm -hmm. one. It was mm -hmm. um, different chamber reps. Were you, did you actually sit on the? I did. Okay, yeah. there you go. <laughs> um, so it was different organizations that helped funnel down that decision. I think outside of us, they're the experts of knowing who is going to thrive in our community and also mm -hmm. able to give those businesses the right resources to actually be successful from funding and business skills and training and yeah, so we supported it, but we we didn't play really a hands-on role in it. It was just fun to watch. <laughs> Sorry. I just have a that. real quick question. Um, your connections corridor, it's kind of been a, a carrot held for the last 20 years and nothing has ever moved. Nothing's ever gone down the tracks on this thing. Do you guys have any actual sustainable information regarding meeting with federal governments, meeting with actual decision makers on how we're going to, how that's going to move ahead in another 20 years. If we got any actual evidence of what's going on, mm -hmm. if it's even. Yeah, interesting, interesting to frame it as, as a carrot. Uh, at this point in time, we are in the process of developing the relationships to set that solid foundation moving forward, which is a very different framework from 20 years ago in 2005 when the pre-feasibility study was done. When the pre-feasibility study was done, it was like, here, this is what we want to do. Do you want to come to our party? 
This year, this time around, we're doing it different. We're doing it very grassroots and bringing all of those people and organizations together to define what it is. Uh, we have, uh, it's at the table with the Economic Corridors Task Force under Shane Getson. Uh, he has come down from Lac St. Anne and met with the Transportation Logistics Task Force meeting. Uh, group and said that we are on the right track. Absolutely. What we're doing and how we're doing it. It's a new way of doing business. The old way of doing business was here you go. Do you want to buy in? Whereas this way, it's much more collaborative uh, and engaging and relationship building first so that you can go further, unfortunately, slower <laughs> uh, because all the hard work is done in the bit in the beginning, creating those stakeholder relationships. Uh, the federal government, uh, our MPs um, that we have spoken with are very supportive. They have been for the over past 20 years, absolutely. Um, do we anticipate it getting through uh, in this federal government? That's very, that's very hopeful, but it's also a little bit risky at this point. Um, but having the BC uh, side on board with it as well, it gives us a lot more collateral to advocate. And uh, the, actually, uh, speaking to chambers, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, they have a document out, and I encourage you all to take a look at it, and you can just do a quick snapshot of their three pillars, which are deal with COVID, get the fundamentals right, and opportunities for 2021 uh, and beyond. And in getting the fundamentals right, they're advocating to the government of Canada uh, to increase the National Corridor Fund. So we are in line with the feds, we're in line with the province right now, and we're in line with the majority of um, our members in advocating and moving this forward. You said you had the provincial government in BC on board with this? I said that we have elected officials in the CSRD and economic developers that, that we're engaging and building relationships with in order to build a solid foundation to move this forward. Okay. And there's a number, of them, a number of them that are very interested in what uh, we're working towards together. Okay. Yes, uh, just, I'm just looking at your, um, the map of your associates and municipalities that are part of CAPE. Uh, the vast majority, probably 90%, are either right on the Highway 2 corridor within a 10 minute uh, on either side of the Highway 2 corridor. So my question is, excluding the issue of, of the house pass, the, the connections corridor, what specific initiatives does CAPE have for the Rocky Mountain House area? Mm -hmm. So I think back to um, our municipal investment attraction readiness program. And one of the more recent pieces of that uh, is a regional land, industrial land inventory, shovel-ready land inventory. And had Rocky Mountain House been a member, you would have had all your land listed in there with a high-level analysis done. And we did that in partnership with our consultant for every municipality in central Alberta that was a member. So that in and of itself and being able to put that on your website, um, you know, one of the one of the things that has been identified in central Alberta is where is the shovel ready land? And if you want to bring investment and business into your community, you need to have that shovel ready land. I'm sure you've heard this before in, in Clearwater County. So identifying what that is. Um, also, our investment attraction matrix, Rocky Mountain House played a role in developing what those industries would be. Now, this document is something where you can look at the 12 industries identified and determine, and it determines, it tells you what the high, medium, and low priority factors are for that industry to come into your community. So your EDO can take a look at that document and say, hey, we've got eight of the 10 high priority factors. It's worth my while and the taxpayer's dollar for us to go after this site selection and query. Alternatively, if you only have two of the high priority factors, you're not gonna waste your time. But thirdly, if you're halfway there, and it's something that council and the community is really very interested in, in doing, um, council can direct administration strategically to increase the number of high priority factors in your tool pouch, so to say, right? So if that's, if a, if a let's say it's a daycare, Right. And so you need you have. You have five out of the 10 high priority factors, uh, but you still need like early childhood educators 
maybe. Um, so you can advocate and you can work towards educating them, maybe through Campus Alberta Central, uh, educating people to be ECEs so that you have more opportunity to be successful in attracting that kind of business. Um, that's a really simple example. Um, what else? The community profile that you took advantage of uh, with our expansion program, uh, we're looking at updating those, which would normally cost a community probably around $3,000, maybe $4,000 to just update it. Um, but with the anticipated grant funds and the bulk purchasing with CAPE, you're able to get that for $1,500 to $2,000. Um, so those are just a few examples. What we really try to do, because not every community is at the level of sophistication in economic development as the city of Red Deer, who doesn't use a lot of our projects and programs, they're throwing money in because they believe in regional collaboration. And they do partake in events and things like that, but not everybody's as sophisticated as a Rocky Mountain House or a Sylvan Lake um, and that. And so one of the real challenges with CAPE is being able to create programs and projects that meet everybody's needs. And so the model that we've been trying to execute on is that we can have high level training um, for everybody, right? So investment attraction readiness training, we did that three or four times across the region and everybody was invited to come regardless of your level of sophistication. And then you could do a deeper dive and have our consultants come in and do an assessment of your community. And Clearwater County chose to do that and they invited Rocky Mountain House to join in. But Rocky Mountain House didn't do it. But that was your choice. That's not my choice to whether or not you engage and, and take part in the organization and, and what we're offering. You also have an opportunity to have a say in what we're offering if you're if you're a member. So that way the Elnoras or the Carolines could participate in investment attraction readiness because quite frankly, they're not ready to use an assessment of their investment attraction readiness. They're not there yet. So why waste their money on something like that? I believe uh, Councillor Frazier has a question. You just touched on a point and I, I kind of wanted to explore it. So you had mentioned that the cost would have would be $1,500 to $2,000 for this community profile. That would be over and above our membership? That would be to update the community profile that you already have. That typically would have cost you $13,000, $14,000 to do on your own. That because of CAPE, <coughs> our bulk purchasing ability and a CARES grant, we were able to get it down to five dollars or $6,000 per municipality. So yes, that would be over and above. There's other things that you get that are included within your membership, but it's kind of like a gym membership. You pay, you pay to go to the gym, right? You, you, you pay to have a gym membership and then you have to pay for the gas to get there. You have to pay for the babysitter. You have to pay for the shoes, the, the workout equipment and all that kind of stuff before you can get to the gym. So that, those are the added costs there. But if you don't go to the gym, come January 1st, come December 31st, you bought a gym membership but you haven't done anything to, to get in shape. So you've bought the membership, but you haven't participated and you haven't bought all those extra things. So there's two points that I'm trying to make there is one, you have to participate in order to get your value. And two, there's additional costs to membership if you so choose um, to participate in those pieces that um, those are optional projects and programs that you can participate in for an added added cost. That being said, there's still in the investment attraction readiness uh, piece, the opportunity to attend for free investment attraction training that the Carolines and Elnora's and Clearwater, everybody else would attend as well. So you have that opportunity to attend with your municipal membership. And then if you want that value add piece, then there's an additional cost. Okay, we've just got yes, go one more. Uh, you have talked about many voices being a louder voice and uh, Councillor Phillips touched on it. When you're with a large group, if everybody is pushing towards the same goals, then absolutely a louder voice makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at the map, I can understand how a lot of these uh you know, municipalities around that corridor have, have very similar interests. And I think the Connections Corridor is the best example of that for them. Yeah, the House Pass, I'm sure, makes a lot of sense because if it happens, they become a, a hub 
Whereas for us, it doesn't make as much sense. There's a lot of issues there federally. It, there's only 24 kilometers on the Alberta side. It would need to go through a national park. It would need multiple levels of approval. It goes through indigenous land and the province of BC has pretty much said kaputs several times, uh, not to mention the, you know, municipalities on the other side that have their own views of that particular project. I just fear that that project has gotten quite loaded and is taking focus away from other projects that we could be exploring as a region. Can I comment on that? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. So I, I find it interesting, wonderful questions, by the way, like really good questions, so hats off. I'm the person in the room that's not paid that's here as a volunteer. And I'm here taking time out of my day because I believe in Cape and I also believe in Rocky Mountain House being at the table. I know we've covered a few topics, including the corridor. Uh, we've talked about the Chamber of Commerce versus the Cape. Uh, we've talked about whether or not BC's on board or not on board. But I would encourage you all, councillors, you're about to make a decision. The bottom line is 70% of most municipal funding goes to the cities. Unfortunately, the rural and the cities have almost been pitted against each other. Majority of healthcare money goes to the cities. The majority of infrastructure money goes to the cities. And now more than ever is a time that we have to come together and be banded together. So council, I would encourage you, as you must look at opportunities to diversify your economy from an unstable oil and gas that the world is actually now against you on, now more than ever, you need a Didsbury, an Olds and a Sundry that's also advocating for you. Even though they may be on that corridor, they rely on your support to maintain their infrastructure. And so as we talk about being advocates, how are we going to go to the government if we're not flying at 70,000 feet? Because the Chamber of Commerce and as a chamber member, I fly at six or eight feet every day when I walk in and out of my business. But you as the elected official have to clear a pathway for me to be able to do business. And I wanna encourage you, when we talk about the corridor, it's important to know, I personally had over an hour discussion with Jason Kenny on this project. He told me he's met with uh, Premier Horgan, who's very sick right now. But when we presented the concept that we need to lead with the indigenous, as this is their uh, land, all of a sudden, it was like, wow, I never thought about that. When we talk about moving barriers with the federal government, working with the indigenous who, who established that trading route is gonna be a new path for us to bring collaboration together. And I wanna encourage you that I need you guys on this team. If you don't believe that the corridor is where the focus would be, I'm gonna tell you right now, our focus is on economic development and rebuilding Alberta. Our focus is gonna be allowing and making opportunity for you to get in front of elected officials that you nor, nor, not normally would be able to get in front of and they recognize your face. And I really, really wanna encourage you because I need you to be on this because I'm on it as a volunteer because I believe in something big. And right now is when we need to come together. And I need a business route. I need a, I need a champion from Rocky Mountain House. That champion will open up doors that maybe you feel Cape hasn't opened for you before. So please. With that, Madam Mayor and Council, thank you so much, so much. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, we've covered all the questions that we have. And I just wanted to extend our very uh, uh, thank you, our appreciation. If you're traveling in a blizzard today that <laughs> rained last night, now it snowed, come all the way to Rocky Mountain House to give us this, and on uh, Zooming, uh, to give us this presentation. Um, we, we are trying to get some highway work done. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that uh, the Chamber of Commerce identified it's their number one priority for the election was economic development on their six, their six items that we all participated in their forum. So um, I think we can all say that everyone here appreciates the importance of economic development. And I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for having us. And, you know, the more the more hands in the pot to do economic development, the better it will be in the end. Thank you very much. Take care. If we could have just a four minute recess while we bring the Browns in for the next um, delegation. That would be fantastic.
um, Mayor, our light <laughs> mic for live, and our cameras are back on whenever you are ready. Perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm very pleased this afternoon to um, have a delegation from Mrs. Brenda Brown and her husband, Mel Brown, on behalf of MAD Red Deer. Thank you very much for coming. I look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much for having me. Do I need to click on my thing? Uh, if you're ready to go through the presentation, absolutely. Yeah. I will pass you the mouse. Um, and it's just a scroll. Okay. So I will be looking up here, I guess, then not there, right? That's right. And then okay. as long as your microphone is on, okay. I'll you as well. You can just speak. And I'll get the lights so it's a little clear. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. This is kind of new to me. So. Um, Thank you very much for having Mel and I today to um, launch Red Rib Project Red Ribbon in our area. We had a big launch a week ago in Red Deer, not a big launch because of COVID, but a really good launch in Red Deer. Um, and it seems like the town is on board because we have about 25 boxes, coin boxes with bookmarks and decals throughout the community. So um, I'm going to start now. I'm just going to kind of read through the presentation, but I will be stopping at points to add, add to it. So um, this is the Project Red Ribbon Holiday Awareness uh, Safety Campaign. Whoops, what did I do there, guys? I needed her help more than I thought. <laughs> Trace will just come over and... Oh, there we go. So I'm probably clicked on the wrong side here. Just while they're doing that, Brenda, I just yeah. thought that uh, the article on the front page of the Mountaineer last week was yeah. lovely with, uh, with, with you and, the and, the, and Larry and the boys. Yeah. It was a lovely, lovely article. And yes. Yeah. Now, can you tell me which one I'm supposed to press to click with? Is it the middle or the, like I clicked on the left side, the roller. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, oh, I see. Okay, got you guys. I now, probably now start to scroll. Now yeah, this is totally different than what I use. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Impaired driving in Canada. So hundreds of Canadians are killed and thousands are injured every year in crashes involving alcohol, cannabis, and or other drugs. Impaired driving is 100% preventable. Impaired driving is not an accident. Someone makes a decision to get behind the wheel impaired. MAD Canada's mission is to stop impaired driving and to support victims of this violent crime. And I'd like to add to this because although it was a middle-aged man who killed our daughter, it is because I was a high school librarian in our community for 27 years that I have presented Chloe's story to more than 3,000 high school students from 2017 to 2019. Sadly, none since we encountered COVID-19. I love high school kids and my hope is to continue to reach out to them in communities in our area and the Red Deer area. It is so important to not just lecture people about driving impaired, but to educate them as soon as they are of age to drive. I feel it is important to say that road crashes continue to be the leading cause of death among teenagers. The statistics are alarming. Young people have the highest rates of traffic death and injury per capita among all age groups and the highest death rate per kilometer driven among all drivers under 75 years of age. More 19 year olds die or are seriously injured than any other age group. Motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death among 16 to 25 year olds and alcohol and or drugs are a factor in 55% of those crashes. I invite parents to visit mad.ca to find more important data around youth and impaired driving. Let's try this one. <laughs> 
that we got. Project Red Ribbon is our annual awareness campaign to promote sober driving during the holiday season. This year's campaign runs from November 1st to January 4th. It is the 34th annual Project Red Ribbon campaign. Project Red Ribbon targets the Christmas and New Year holiday season because it is the busiest time of year on most social calendars and a time of high risk for impaired driving. And although it's bittersweet, we are honored that our daughter Chloe, along with her sons Jackson and Kessler, have been chosen to be the face of MAD Canada's 2021 Project Red Ribbon campaign. We were and are very grateful to MAD as they told us how they could help our devastated family. They offered us access to numerous resources, support groups hosted by trained victim services, per, victim service personnel, and they flew us to Toronto to attend the National Candlelight Vigil of Hope and Remembrance. We paid absolutely nothing for any of these services. It is our hope that lending Chloe's story for the 2021 Project Red Ribbon holiday campaign will help to raise awareness, a tremendous amount of awareness across the country and be a catalyst for change because that, along with supporting victims and survivors like me, is what MAD does every single day. I joined the Red Deer and District chapter four years ago and my heart has found a safe and comforting place there trying to make a difference. If you know of someone who is a victim of impaired driving, please have them reach out to us. So you kind of see some pictures of Chloe there, but the, the, the program that was used, the, the pictures all flowed in beautifully for everyone to see, but she was a beautiful, beautiful soul and very loved. Let me tell you a little bit about Chloe. There are those who, from the time they're old enough to understand how they can make a difference in the lives of others, they already have. That was Chloe, our beautiful child. She was only 30 years old when an impaired driver killed her and shattered the hopes and dreams of those who loved her most. A husband, two small sons, a sister and her family, and deeply broken parents were left to wonder how they could ever live without her. And so it seemed that we would have Chloe to love for so many more years, but it was not to be because on a cold November day at 5.21 PM, an impaired driver many times over the limit took her life in an instant and left me screaming in the darkness. So many times I still feel myself screaming this deep inside and praying that it was all a dream. In that one entirely preventable moment, all of our lives were changed forever. I know now that the strength we unearthed in the days and months ahead was meant to help two little boys find their way and come to know that even on the darkest of days, we can be wrapped in so much love that the sun shines through. November 21st, 2014 had started out to be such a wonderful day with Chloe and I spending time together in Red Deer Christmas shopping. Her dad was caring for her sons at their home in the country, a half hour from the city. The boys staying home with Mel was a blessing we would forever be thankful for. As we journeyed home with Chloe driving, I mentioned that I wanted to pick up Chinese takeout for dinner for all of us. There was a little town just 10 minutes from Chloe's home, and so I placed our order. I will forever feel like I was to blame for suggesting we venture off the highway and for being unable to save her. We turned off the main highway onto the road that would lead us into Eppville, laughing, sharing stories and talking about Christmas. I never imagined that in a few moments, a drunk driver would rip my child away from me and destroy all that we held most dear. I had no idea we were on a bridge when he hit us head on killing himself and Chloe. The crash was horrific. Her large SUV was beyond recognition. My oldest grandson's car seat was laying by the back tire because the entire driver's side was ripped off. How I was alive, no one could understand. When half of me died with my child that day and the other half was still struggling to survive. I often wonder if Chloe 
and God were with me in that mangled vehicle as I remained pinned for about three hours with my daughter's lifeless body laying over the steering wheel, just barely out of my reach. I desperately needed to see her face and to hold her, but my seatbelt and airbag had tightly restrained me. Then and there on that dark highway, I lost the biggest part of myself. I would never again hold my beautiful girl. Every minute of the day, I pray Chloe is at peace in heaven. Our beloved daughter was surrounded by people who loved and admired her. She was a beautiful soul and she left many beautiful memories behind. Besides her sons, Chloe's legacy is that she will always be remembered as someone who touched the hearts of those who so desperately needed kindness, inclusion, compassion, and the reassurance of her beautiful smile. A red ribbon is a symbol of the importance of always driving sober. We're urging people to take a few minutes to plan ahead. If you're going to be consuming alcohol, cannabis, or other drugs, leave the car at home. Take an Uber or a taxi, take public transit, arrange a desert driver, designated driver, or plan to spend the night. We ask Canadians to display our red ribbon or red ribbon car decals on their vehicles, keychains, purses, briefcases or backpacks as a reminder that it is never okay to drive drunk or high. If you see someone you suspect is driving impaired, please call 911. On November 21st, it will be seven years since we lost Chloe. For Mel and I, it seems like yesterday. And for her two young sons, there will always be a special piece of their heart shaped like their mummy and a big piece missing as they learn to go on without her. As I conclude this presentation to you, Mayor Beach and Council, I wish to thank you for recognizing the importance of Project Red Ribbon and send the message that driving impaired is a choice. Sadly, what often results is not an accident, but a horrifying, life-altering, life-taking crash. If you have had more than two drinks, we beg of you to do the right thing for all who love you. Take a safe ride home, and if your friend is about to drive while impaired by drugs or alcohol, take away the keys. Because if someone had done that on November 21st, 2014, Chloe would still be here today, leaving her loving mark on the world. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Still so hard, hey? Yeah. Sorry, Brenda, that was oh. beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for coming. I appreciate it. It was beautiful. You're welcome. Um, I just was going to say before, before I started that uh, last night, Mel and I took Jackson and Kessler and we tied red ribbons around 50 of the light standards um, on down Main Street. So. Yes, they were quite enthusiastic about that. So thank you for letting us do that. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I just need a moment. I... <laughs> So um, we have another delegation today. It's 3.3 um, in the agenda. It's um, Mr. Ben Wirth and Ms. Robin Began uh, from the Town of Rocky Mountain House Library Board. And uh, will this be a minute to getting us all hooked up again? And thank you very much for coming. Ben and Robin, do you need to go ahead? No, I don't think so. Thank you. Um, use the space bar button. Okay. <laughs> 
following that is hard. <laughs> Chloe was a personal friend, so it's all good. <laughs> Sorry, Robin. It's okay. Had I known, I would have prepared myself, but I knew a little bit before, so we're okay. But I'm Robin. I am currently the chair for the Rocky Public Library, and I've been on the board for three years now, coming up in January, and I'm excited to be serving again for another three-year term with these amazing humans. So um, yeah, so we're here today just to answer any questions you may have regarding our budget proposal for the upcoming year. I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to take a look and if you've had, have some questions formulated, I'm here to answer and Ben also has the expertise of the hands-on, so. Sorry, I have some counselor, uh, Fraser. It, it's less of a question, it's just more of a, a comment that the letter covers some of it, but I just wanted to thank you for your service to Rocky. You, throughout the pandemic, you have been responsive and flexible and always looking after the needs of the communities, whether it's the youth programs or reaching out uh, to the adult community or helping people with tutors. The, Rocky is incredibly lucky to have the library and the staff library that we have. So uh, just thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for the comment. Um, yeah, we, we have a great team at the library and we've done our best to be adaptive and responsive to all of the changes uh, mm -hmm. that we've you know had to respond to over the last, uh, She's 20 months. It's, it's, it's been a while. Lot. And uh, <laughs> and yeah, we've um, you know, now it uh, it's kind of par for the course, um, but it's definitely something that um, yeah, mm -hmm. our, our team has has worked diligently to to be responsive and adaptive as the needs of the community change, whether because of the pandemic or or whatever the case may be. It's been a pleasure working with. Ben, who has been a great advocate in helping us understand what the changes would be with the board because it's constantly changing and the adaptations that they've made to try and make sure that the community still has all the services that they have been accustomed to have been amazing in the ways that they're able to adjust and adapt and provide that same level of service and intimacy with the clients and the people of the community that have needed the supports, I think. It's been really nice for me to know that we have a team that is still dedicated to making sure that those services find the people that need them. And we've appreciated the support of having Len on our board because he can let us know what things may be coming in the community that people might need more support with. So it's been, it's been really good seeing a lot of the partnerships grow. Len, because Right. Len, because you're on the library board, did you have any questions that for the delegation? Uh, not not questions for the de delegation, but uh, you know, definitely accolades. This is this was a tough budget. Uh, you know, when the when the draft of it came out, we had to make some uh, decisions and difficult decisions. And uh, if if everyone has read the looked at the budget, the materials line is the is the one line that took the hardest hit, uh, which means there's just less materials available uh, for the library but in order to keep a you know a, a budget that that is attainable and usable that was one of the decisions that had to be made um does anyone else have any questions for the thank you mayor our constant counselor Frazier. constable mayor i, I keep getting a promotion <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I guess the, the budget, uh, I can see that you've done lots of work um, just comparing it to last year's budget and you've to come out with the 1.5% increase is pretty impressive. Uh, I guess to end on maybe a more community minded note, uh, can you guys each tell me what project or program that you were most excited about last year that you just wanna, you maybe wanna share? because there's so many, I know that I've missed some. <laughs> For me, my favorite thing that they put in place over the pandemic was creating opportunities for connection in the community 
when people couldn't enter the doors. So built those make and take kits, the craft kits that families could take home with instructions, join online to learn how to do it. That was a huge piece of keeping people connected to the service that they had been using for so many years and families had come to rely on it as a source of entertainment, a way to build their children's skills when they're not yet in school and all the other services had kind of disappeared. Um, other than that online and make and take kit type situation. But I loved the ingenuity of one of our staff members creating a story walk at the parks. So finding a way to still have story time and allow families to spend time together outside in a socially distanced and safe way. And I think that has been one of my favorite things is taking the kids to the park and being like, yay, look, we can read this book all the way together and it's an adventure. So. Yeah, those were a couple of my favorite things throughout the last year that seemed to just give that opportunity for families to still find a space where they could connect with library type programming. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, similar to Robin. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's been so many uh, programs that we've we've run over the last year or so. Um, the take and make kits have been exceptionally popular in the community and even mm -hmm when our doors have reopened and, um, you know, people have been able to come in and access, you know, things in person, um, there's still been the demand for those. Um, they've been so popular because they allow families to kind of, you know, take their own time and do things on a schedule that works best for them. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really pleased that we're able to continue providing those. Um, as far as one specific thing that, that uh, I'm really pleased with over the past year, um, we had the opportunity, we did a a live radio drama presentation online, which was really fun, where we just had people, you know, anyone who was interested in the community could come in and uh, take a role from a script. And we just, you know, we did a couple of rehearsals and then read through this. Um, it happened one night, uh, play together. You know, some people had their own uh, fun character voices they put into it. And, and that was a great opportunity, you know, because um, especially for our live theater community, they were missing out on of course, the shows that couldn't happen. So that was a great way to bring that together. And that's something we're actually looking on doing additional shows going forward because of the, the enthusiasm for that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. I have to comment that my son loved the Nerf night <laughs> <laughs> or else I wouldn't be able to go home this evening, but we go to the library a lot. And I know it doesn't seem like a very library type thing, but anything to get my 12 year old boy to read a book and go to the library. Like he, he loved those little take home kits. And he, I can't tell you how excited he was to read when they were the Knights this summer on oh, the, yes. on the trail and which group he was with. I think he was with the red Knights or the something. And he loved following it along every week when we went in it. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah, it was, it's really hard to get a boy to read a book. <laughs> So yeah, that. Thank you very much for that. Do we have any other questions or comments for the delegation? Well, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for being so brave to follow up, Brent. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I gotta find my ground again. This is, yeah, it's okay. Yes. Following her is hard, but it's worth it. Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you for you. having us. Yes, and thank you so much. Yeah, congratulations to every single one of you. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Mary and Counselors. We we appreciate your support. Okay, so moving forward, 4.1, to adopt regular council minutes from November 9th. Does anyone have any questions or concerns about the council minutes from November 9th? Um, can I have a motion then? Ms. Caparo. I will make a motion to adopt the previous council meeting minutes. Thank you very much. All in favor? <laughs> Carried. Yay. <laughs> okay, 5.1, delegation business. Um, delegation CAPE with Miss Kimberly Worthington. Um, do you wanna carry that over to old business or do we? Yeah. Yes. Your Worship, so um, uh, just a suggestion the council is probably accepted for information uh, here and then it could be dealt with under 6.1. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can I have a motion then please? Uh, Councillor Frazier. I so move. And all in favor? So that's carried. 
6.1, the RFD for CAPE membership. RFD is the... Um, I'm sorry. I thought we did it all at one thing. Could we have a motion for 5.2, the MAD delegation? All in favor, and that's carried. So 5.3, the delegation for the Town of Rocky Mountain House Library Board. Can we have a motion, please? I'll make a motion for that. All in I favor? Have, I have a question. Oh, absolutely. Are we approving their budget? Actually, this is just- um, Could you turn your microphone on, please? I oh. believe we're just making a motion to accept it for information. Would you like to make a motion for something further? Do we need to make a motion to approve their increase? Um, your worship, so what I would suggest to council is that uh, council uh, defer their budget request to council's budget meeting. Uh, then it can be discussed with the, the council's entire budget. So then the motion we're looking for today is just to accept the information from the delegation. And consider the request at the council's budget meetings. So I'm looking for a motion. Okay, I'll do my motion to include all that. Okay, so <laughs> Tracy, do you got that? Wonderful. All in favor, and that's carried. Moving forward, bold business, the RFD request for decision. Um, so this, we just listened to the presentation again, or for the first time for CAPE. And um, would we like to discuss this? And then we have any comments that they would like to talk about for joining CAPE? Councillor All, did you have something? 100%, um, are we going to, to try and rejoin CAPE in my opinion is, not where we want to go. Um, many reasons we can talk about it all afternoon. But we've been involved with Cape for 20 years. Um, to try and qualify what we've gotten out of Cape, I've struggled with it for the last three weeks. I know they talk about economic development and bringing everything through as a larger voice. We just can't, I can't put an actual monetary dollar figure on a return on investment that we've had. Moving forward, if we wanna keep going down that road, I would rather see it as a joint use. We have the Clearwater counties involved with it, the chambers involved in it, if we're involved with in it, I see it going down the road as all three of us joining together, go through the IDP, make one, one person sit on the board for the region. Everybody wants to work together. I see that as being a much better dollar value. But that's just my opening opinion. Uh, Councillor Hutchinson. Um, you said it's been 20 years that the town's been a part of Cape. Do we have any, did we have people sitting on the board? Just like um, the Sylvan lady had said, it's when you get into it, what you put into it. What's, what has been done, what, have, what kind of involvement has the town had with Cape? Does anybody know? So, like, go ahead, I, Councillor Phillips. I, I never sat on the Cape board personally, but the discussion, and this is again previous council, uh, the discussion is that the more than 90% of their members are within that highway two or 10 minutes off of the highway two corridor. And that's where the bulk of the focus from Cape is being focused on is that. Highway Two corridor, and you know we're we're on the the most fringe of of what Cape's uh, area of realm would would encompass, and that we weren't just weren't getting the uh, the bang for a buck basically, because the bulk of the focus was on Highway Two. To answer your question, yes, the previous mayor was on the board. I'm assuming previous councils they were we've been involved with it since the inception uh, I don't I can't say for sure uh, the previous mayors or councils what they did but the last the last one was definitely on it 
there just was not, it just seemed to be too scattered. There was no clear direction. These guys are, I think they have a great vision for the corridor, Highway 2. But I don't, like you look at, when you look at that map, the everybody that's on the fringes is either dropped off or they're uh, never been on it to begin with. Um, Red Deer, Pinoca, Mountain View, they all at, in 2018, 2017, had made the decision to go off of Cape because they weren't seeing the return for their dollar. They all chose to stay on it to keep the membership up. But basically the, everybody's opinion was that they just didn't see the revenue or didn't see the expenses being worth it. The city of Red Deer, the big one, they changed their mind because they thought if they pulled out, there'd be a big hole in the center right in the middle of what they were doing. So they opted to stay in for everybody else. I don't see us staying a part of Cape having any effect on the rest of the outfit. I, I, I just, I like the idea of it. And I just think that you, you get what you put into things. And I don't remember seeing or hearing anything coming from previous council. And again, I, I may be wrong. Maybe I just couldn't find it, but I, I think it's an opportunity. We are in the outside. So let's be a bigger voice and let's push harder for them to have that corridor mm -hmm. coming back here to us and and uh, putting some focus on this area. Thank you very much, Councillor Fraser. So the previous mayor was on the board and I know Fred Nash was also a member of the executive board. I'm not sure about before that, but there has been a representative from Rocky Mountain House on that board until we came out. So it's not that, that they haven't been involved. My problem with CAPE specifically is that they're still very focused on the house pass, which I think was a great idea in 1998, but we're fighting our own battles here with the twinning of Highway 11. And we really want to lobby the province that we want to bring that highway all the way through. We want to get that interchange done. We want to open up that 22 corridor. The argument for the house pass is it saves 90 minutes on the drive to Vancouver. If we're lobbying on one side that we need to save 20, 90 minutes, we need to spend a billion dollars to build this highway to save 90 minutes. It makes it really hard on the other side of it to say, well, you should bring the highway through town because it would be better for town. The, the house pass is the number one argument to bypass the town. And that's a problem for me. It makes me nervous when they, that that is still their main project, despite all of the, the issues with getting it approved in the first place, which I feel is rather unrealistic considering how long it's been on the books. But where we are and what we are trying to do with the highway is contrary to the arguments we would be making for the house pass. And so I understand that that's important to that area and it would absolutely make Red Deer a regional hub. I just think that we have more pressing issues and I think it's not serving us the best. Thank, thank you very much. So <clears throat> I'd like to take this opportunity if no one else has a comment. I think that the economic development of our community is like a priority for our town. We need businesses to come and do development. It's very important for our financial stability. Oil field has not been reliable. We all talk about tourism and how important that is. I think it's somewhat short-sighted to have a meeting with transportation this week at the AUMA and to inquire input information on Highway 11 if we have not even taken the initiative to join a, a group like CAPE who come together and work in partnership with each other. So I understand that your reluctance with the house pass. I still think that Cape brings a lot of value to our community. I am very excited to be part of it. I think that through this election process, the community has spoken that they would like some changes to how we run our council. And I appreciate all of your opinions on the past, but I think moving forward, being part of Cape is going to be very essential to communicating with other municipalities, 
with other governments, with lobbying other levels of government, um, because the feds, it's, there is a process and they're putting the burden of all these things from RCMP to infrastructure, from those levels of government down to municipalities. There's a huge push to go away from rural um, uh, focus and onto urban. So like our dollars, if you talk to, it's not Iglinski, it's MP Soroka, they are, are all urban centers and we need something that we can glue us together. We can have support. We can talk to each other. We can um, like come together in partnerships. It's going to show us a lot when we go to lob lobby the government. And I'm not saying that CAPE's going to help us lobby the government. I'm saying it's just short-sighted that we're not even a part of CAPE and we're trying to say we'd like to work together with all these other groups and get our highway and get our community. And it's important for our economic development. If we go to the 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 AUMA and talk to the transportation minister for 15 minutes and discuss three things. I think it's just ridiculous that we're not already part of a CAPE where we're saying that we're committed to getting along with our partnerships. We're committed to working together with other municipalities. The highway expansion, if you look at it, it goes A, B, C, D. So on the books, they haven't even put the money through for A yet. And, and when you talk to our minister Nixon, he, it doesn't even go all the way to the west side of Rocky. We have to figure that out. And we, we're going to need some support and some help for our community. And I think being part of Cape is, is, is important for that. So my recommendation is that we join Cape. And I would like to suggest that I would like a recorded vote on this. Go ahead. I, you know, in, in hearing Councillor Ald's uh, discussion on possibly having CAPE as a regional, uh, you know, regional initiative as opposed to a Clearwater County or a town of Rocky or a town of Caroline, uh, having it as a regional initiative, I, I kind of like that idea a little bit. Also, one, one of the decisions or one of the reasons why uh, we had we moved off of CAPE was there was a fledgling uh, group of Drayton Valley Hinton, Edson, Sundry, trying to create a Cape West, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. because the Highway 22 corridor is very, very important to the town of Rocky Mountain House. The Highway 2 corridor is important, but not as important as the Highway 2 corridor or 22 corridor. And that was, you know, if we look at Councillor Ald's suggestion of maybe making Cape a regionalized uh, entity, maybe we can do the same with. Hinton, Edson, Drayton Valley, Sundry, and have something for the West part. So we're getting economic benefits from both mm -hmm. Highway 2 and Highway 22 corridor. So and I think it's just a further, like it's a it's a part of a broad discussion that we probably have to spend more time on. No, I, I don't disagree that Highway 22 is an important corridor, but Highway 11 is something that we are dealing with right now. Highway 22, there's no expansion plans. There's no commitment. The group that was trying to be put together, according to Mr. Kroos, has fallen apart and it doesn't exist right now. So I just don't think we should wait any further. We need to jump on board and start working with our fellow neighboring communities and, and get some economic development and, and work together. Is that not correct that the, that group is no longer in existence. Those it's all had many changes. Yeah, your worship. So I mean, it was a collaboration between five municipalities, um, it, and that was on two levels. One was with, with the CAOs. Um, three of the CAOs of the five have moved on to different municipalities. So right now it's stagnant. Right. Um, our EDOs do work together, and it's more on the winter excursion program that they did last year. Uh, and on the electric highway vehicle charging system, which is in sitting in a granting stage right now. Um, just a suggestion to council. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I sent out to council the economic development strategy um, that was just adopted less than a year ago. Um, it might be council may want to have a task force meeting to go through that strategy to see if the initiatives in that strategy are still relevant to this council and then look at it if CAPE advances or does not advance any of those strategies that council wants to do. Um, and that might um, 
help counsel in making this decision? Well, when you go on to the Alberta website for the government of Alberta and you click under economic development, it has a direct link to CAPE right on there. It's like three down. I, I, just, I still think that as part of an RIDA, an RDA, it's important that we be part of this group. Go ahead, Ms. Frazier, Mayor, uh, Council, Councillor Frazier. So, but the RIDAs are being defunded by the province. So it, I understand that they're struggling and that their rates are have to go up because that's how things go. But we're, we're looking at, you can't, if you join CAPE, we can't leave CAPE for two years. And they're talking about it going from 40 cents per capita to 90 cents per capita. So they're, they're going to double and we are stuck for at least two years. And it's going to go up every year. We, we were a member for almost 20 years. I still have a hard time finding a concrete, this is what CAPE has done. And I understand that being part of CAPE might look good on a resume, but is it actually getting our money's worth? Are we able to have a regional presence with Clearwater County and Caroline and share that and then be part of more groups, more initiatives instead of, I guess, putting all of our eggs in the Cape basket. Is there a smarter way to do this? So when you talk about the monetary budget, we have no problem spending $8,000 on a youth group, but this is an economic development where we're partnerships with all these communities. Uh, let me finish. I'll with all finish. these communities in Rocky Mountain House, the governance study that we just did said it's going to be five to 10 years before we amalgamate with the County of Clearwater and Caroline, if that's what you're insinuating. No, no that's not what I'm, I, I, I was uh, discussing what Councillor Ald had suggested that we have a regional presence on the Cape Board. So Clearwater County and Rocky Mountain House and the Village of Caroline at our joint meeting, we discuss whether CAPE is meeting our strategic economic development goals for the region. And if we feel that it makes sense, then perhaps we appoint somebody and we bring that back to the joint council meeting because it is a regional issue. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't make sense for Clearwater County to pay $4,000 and Rocky Mountain House to pay $4,000. That doesn't make any sense. We're not, we're not getting double the benefits from a membership in Cape. But we're not getting any benefits if we're not a partnership in it. Clearwater County obviously thinks that it's important enough that they've done the membership. The chamber thinks it's important enough that they've got an associated membership. I just don't understand why you so strongly think that it's not going to be a benefit for our community because like, it hasn't I'm willing, been a benefit for 20 years i you know when you talk to milton elliott and he used to go to he started Rita's with lou soffit they found benefit in it because he phoned me and discussed it with me okay but when was he part of kate he was before before my time okay. <laughs> I just, it's, it's just, it's a different world and just being part of every single outside group that is, that uses buzzwords isn't healthy for, it, it's, it's not strategic. We're not being smart about our outside connections and leveraging what we do have. I don't know. When you look at what Sylvan Lake's done compared to what we've done, they've got growth, they've got business, they've got a baseball park. They've, they've done a lot of strives. So I don't see why being a partnership with them or with Olds, who has a, you know, they've grown as well, is a bad thing. It's a, it's a small amount of our budget compared to all the other things that we have going on. It's just one meeting that we could attend to, to give us a lot of benefit. Go ahead, um, Councilor Phillips. Maybe, I, I mean, this seems like a, a large topic that we probably won't get solved today. Uh, I would suggest bringing this to our budget deliberations and, and talking about it during our budget deliberations to potentially go in or not go in, whichever way we decide to go. Just, just food for thought. Councillor Boniface. 
Um, I've tried to research it as much as I'm capable of. I, I see benefits to being in it for the community and, and uh, reading a little of the history of other communities that have been in it, I, I see the benefits, but I also respect the, the counselors that have served before and what they've seen. Is there any way possible for us to look back at past records or something like that, that see if there has been any actual value to the, our community? Um, they seem, from their presentation, they seem like they're quite pushing forward with the how is passed. Now, I moved here in 1976, and they've been talking about a how is passed since 1976. I, I don't think it's going to happen at all while I'm ever a counselor for sure. Um, but we do need someone pushing for us for this Highway 11. And I agree with Mayor Bache that for us not to be part of this organization when we're going to see a minister of transportation this week about the twinning of the highway through Rocky and that we're, uh, we're leaving ourselves out there. It's, I, I, I support joining the organization, but I think some more research and a discussion at the next meeting and let us all have that time might be the benefit. Hi there, Dean. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, since I'm kind of the old guy in the room, I guess, mm -hmm. for being with the town, um, I've been with Cape really as far as right from the get-go in 1999. Um, yeah, they've done, you know, pros and cons to the organization. Um, I know we get a lot of the training side of it out of it for Jeff. Uh, we also get community profile. Uh, we cost shared, uh, re reduction on cost being a member. Uh, we get a yearly community overview, which is handy when we have investors or someone coming to the community to uh, invest within the community. It is a, uh, a document that we're, it's easily uh, sendable uh, and it's in print material as well. Uh, as far as, you know, brick and mortars or uh, businesses, not so much. I know Access Prosperity, which is a partnership to CAPE, uh, they do a lot of the legwork in regards to uh, uh, investment attraction uh, overseas and that type of stuff. And we get leads from them. And, you know, of course they send the lead and they say, we need 40 acres and we need this and that. And, you know, we, we see if we, we have proper uh, land available and that type of stuff. And we work with the county as well in regards to these searches as well. So uh, access prosperity is a lot of boots on the ground compared to what CAPE does, but CAPE, uh, of course, they help fund access prosperity through the fees that we give to CAPE. Uh, but as far as any, say, brick and mortars or them attracting business, not so much. But as far as the resources, uh, someone to ask questions, they're there. And whether they would provide that information, whether you're a member or not, I, I think they would. But it's kind of similar to the Chamber of Commerce. You know, we pay them to run the visitor center, but they're going to give visitor information out whether we pay them or not. So, but, uh, you know, like I said, 20 years, I've seen lots of changes within CAPE. As far as Donna Lar government running, now it's membership driven more as far as uh, executive director. Um, you know, as far as our Highway 222 corridor, yeah, I'd never really got off the ground because no one is really to take the lead on it because everyone's busy within their own communities. Uh, you know, whether it was someone was leading that, maybe would have more, more uh, boots on the ground and, and be able to organize things a bit more. Uh, Highway 22 is more or less, uh, you know, we're working together on projects by project basis. Uh, presently right now, we, you know, we work with Clearwater County on a, on, on a project by project basis. You know, we're doing a supply chain analysis right at the moment with them. Uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, Clearwater County is always willing to, to cost share on projects for economic development. Uh, we also include, try to include uh, Village of Caroline in those projects as well. Comes down to dollars and cents at the end of the day. But like I said, over the 20 years, pros and cons, uh, it's a good uh, networking for the EDO as far as with their sessions. Uh, the AGMs, you know, it's kind of routine as far as the, the spring and, and fall one. And I think there's one coming up December 1st or the 8th. And ideally, you know, I, I guess, hopefully I'm not stepping out of bound, bounds here, but as far as being part of that, you know, if we delay to deliberations, you may not be able to, if, say if you want a member to be on the board, 
you may need to have something in place prior to that December 1st or 8th meeting or whatever. So that's uh, just food for thought as far as if you want to represent representative on the board. So hopefully I haven't thrown myself under the bus here. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's you know, I'm speaking from, you know, the heart and the mind here as far as, you know, last 20 years. Yeah, like I said, bricks and mortars, not so much. Resources, yeah. Networking, yeah. Reduction in projects, yes. I know in the beginning, welcoming communities was a big thing back in the 2000s, making sure our community was, you know, able to welcome the 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 international uh, people to our community and us being ready for it. Um, so yeah, like I said, it's like I say ups and downs, but we do projects that are associated with our community that can benefit our community. Some of the projects we don't see any relevant to it. So we don't participate. So yeah, I'll slide back into my <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Schrader. <laughs> Councillor Frazier. I'm going to suggest, I'm not sure when our next joint council meeting is, but I think that uh, memberships in regional groups should be on that agenda. So if that needs to be part of the motion when it happens. So we, we... Yeah, so we worship, uh, Mr. Reed and I had a conversation yesterday um to be honest with you and uh we both know it's a priority for both our councils to have an icc meeting to talk about various municipal issues uh what we're struggling with now is availability of both councils um but we know we want or the desire to have that before year end um, because we do have some outstanding issues so um i will put it uh, contact mr reed hopefully i'll see him this week uh, and see if we can nail down dates for some ICC meetings because we actually need two different ICC meetings, mm -hmm. both uh, with Caroline and uh, the county, and then also one with just <coughs> the county. Yeah, because there was another letter sent by um, the Daryl Lougheed about uh, the four of us meeting. Yeah, you, I. Uh, yeah, you, thank you, Your Worship, uh, for the reminder. Um, it, it's, um, I provided uh, the county with uh, the times that were there, <laughs> uh, but they have not yet responded to, to, okay. to you know, to a designated time. So yeah. it might be just uh, Mr. Reed and I texting to say, where's your group? Where's my group? And uh, uh, okay. let's find a common time. Yeah, because I know I talked to uh, the Clearwater Reed and he's really anxious as, as well am I to start moving forward on on this, so if we could set that, that would be great. I, I think our next council meeting is not until December 3rd, is that right? No, third is on Friday. Uh, sorry, seventh. and it would be the seventh? I lost my computer here. So. so it would be like to discuss it further to make a decision on Kate, it would be after their AGM. Um, and then that would be another period of time so do we have go ahead councillor boniface uh, the valid point was raised that if we if we were to make a decision sooner than that december date one of us could possibly be on that board which would give us a voice and uh, i i'd like to see that i, I think that would be a better idea yeah, one of the positions they're looking for is because counselor, uh, so Mr. Vandermeer didn't win his riding again. Uh, it was you know, Mr. Northcott. And so he isn't on the board and that's one of the positions that's available, right? We could be, we could have someone from our, our town on the board of directors at the AGM if we decided to go into that. And then that would be like a bigger megaphone. Mm -hmm. Um, for our community, if we could, you know, make those decisions before, you know, just putting it out there that time ticks, right? Councillor Al. I'm just going to finish. I, I'm not in favor of joining Gap back with Cape in the situation where it's at today. If we're willing to look at it on a regional basis, work together with our direct partners, 
I think we take the funds that we're willing to put into CAPE and put that into a made in Rocky Mountain House, made in Clearwater County solution. I see that being much more beneficial. Um, if at the end of the day, council decides to rejoin CAPE, I would like to see it as a regional effort between the county, the chamber through Caroline. So you still have one voice in promoting the area. Uh, so everybody doing their own thing. It just doesn't, it's not, it's not fiscally smart in my opinion, but I think, I think we really got to take a look at it. They came here today. They've come here in the past. They're very good salespeople. Uh, they're marketing people. They, they do the buzzwords, but when you ask them direct questions, you don't get direct answers. Economic development is intangible. Um, you can't put a number on, on return on investment. You can't, there's so many things that they just expect you to agree to and just go along with. And that's just not, for me, it's not acceptable. That's all I wanna see. Councillor Phillips. And I, I, I do, appreciate the fact that they're having their AGM, you know, at the beginning of December, I, I get that. Um, I still think this should be a budgetary discussion item, simply because we are going to have a, an interesting year from a budgetary point of view, because there's a lot of expenses that we're having coming up. Um, I would like it to be part of a big picture uh, discussion. I, I don't know if I'm comfortable making a decision on it today, just because of that. Um, that's just my viewpoint. Any further discussion? Councillor Ald. If there's no more discussion, I'd make the motion that we postpone making a decision on this until we have our budgetary meetings. Uh, I guess we'll vote on that motion. Your worship, just for clarification, so you wanted a recorded vote on this motion? Uh, <laughs> I'm at a loss for words because economic development is so important to our, our community. And, and I understand that the three previous council members are, are not in favor of it. I just feel that it would be good for our council. And uh, so I'm just not sure how I wanna proceed. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Phillips. Sorry, I, I just speaking for myself, I can't speak for my other two, uh, for the other two councillors you, you were talking about. I'm not saying I'm not in favor of what CAPE stands for and what they have to offer. I just wanna make sure that we do this in the right uh, budgetary perspective. Uh, if we can look at a regional opportunity I think that's something that we should look at. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not comfortable making decisions in haste when you can look back two months ago, two months later and go, you know what, we should have made this decision. We should have took the time to make a, a more informed decision. That's, that's my concern. Okay, so we'll go back to Councillor Ald's motion. I don't think it needs to be recorded for this one. Is everybody in favor of, can you repeat your motion please, sir? Uh, just not making a decision on joining CAPE until we go through our budgetary discussions. All in favor? Can I abstain from that? Nope. Carried. Correspondence for action. 8.1, Wild Rose School Division, request for joint meeting. So that's from March 22nd of 2022. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so this is an annual meeting. Uh, unfortunately, over the last two years, I think it's been canceled due to, to COVID, um, but it's a typical meeting um, that we have with the school division and um, to just talk about issues within our community or ideas within our communities. Uh, what's coming up with the school division in the near future, and we should start in 2022, 
under the MGA, we have to have a no, new joint use agreement with the school divisions. So that would probably be one of the discussions at this meeting. Any discussion on this? So I guess we're looking for a motion to accept the request for a meeting. Councillor Hutchinson. I'll make a motion to accept the request for a joint meeting with Wild Grove School Division. All in favor? Carried. Correspondence for, H for information. Could we make a motion because we all have to drive this evening? to accept 9.1 to 9.4 for correspondence for information. Would somebody like to make that motion? I'll make the motion to accept the correspondence for information, 9.1, 9.2, 9.3, 9.4. 9 All in favor? And that's carried. 10.1, any questions about the administration, uh, sorry, administrative reports? So, Mr. Krause. Yeah, th and thank you, Your Worships. So, I know Council is anxious to hit the road today because of weather conditions today, you may. So, normally we'll do the highlights, but if, if Council just wants to ask questions, if anything from the reports, or do you want us to go through the reports? Well, the roads are really bad and we all have to be there tonight. <laughs> so, I feel that we could review this in our hotel rooms once we arrive. And if we have questions, we can bring it up at the next meeting. Does everybody else feel comfortable with that? Yeah. So, could I have a motion to what, what's my motion? I'll, I'll make a motion to accept the CAO report as presented. All in favor? And that's carried. Action list. Any questions about the action list? Oh, I'm so sorry. 10.2 department reports. Mr. Phillips, did you want to, Councillor Phillips, did you want to make a motion to accept those? Sure. I'll, I'll make a motion to accept the uh, department reports as presented. All in favor? And that's carried. Now we're at 11.1 .1 action list. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Krause about the action list? So can I have a motion? motion that we accept the action list. All in favor? And that's carried. So we move to 14.1, the council, we're gonna go into a closed session. Council, oh, I'm sorry. Is there any administrative inquiries? This actually isn't uh, for Dean, but should we have Mr. Frazier come up and introduce himself? Uh, thank you, oh, your, thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, actually, I was going to introduce him during his report, but we kind of skipped through <laughs> the report. <laughs> um, so, um, as council aware, uh, uh, we're, um, what our regular director is on uh, leave right now. Um, so, we've appointed Mr. Fraser as our acting director of engineering and operations. So, um, Mr. Fraser, do you want to introduce yourself or maybe some background Hello, with the town? Normally one of your water and sewer managers. I'm not. Sorry, Councilors. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm normally one of your water and sewer uh, managers. I'm filling in for Rob while he's out on leave. Uh, started with the town back in 2008. My first jig gig was a maternity contract meter reader. Then uh, Public Works hired me on full time. Then there was an opening down at the plant and nobody wanted to go. So I spent 11 years doing that. And I uh, moved back to the Public Works side permanently, dealing with the pipes under the roads for the most part. So that's, uh, that's me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Frazier while well, he's so, so handy? <laughs> No, thank you very much. <laughs> Do we have any notices of motion? Councillor Fraser? I, I just have one admin inquiry. Uh, uh, I was, that's okay. I was contacted by a group that was looking to book the school and they had been told that town, that it was the town that was not allowing bookings. I just wanted to confirm that that was not the case. 
I can see that, um, Mr. I, <laughs> I, I think we have an answer for that. Good afternoon. Yes, to answer your question, our contact with the school is that they're not allowing community groups in at this point. Uh, typically it's booked. We coordinate the bookings of the gym space through my office. And uh, as of last week, when when my assistant contacted them, they were still not, you know, not allowing outside, outside groups to come in. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. We would love to be able to access the, the schools, yeah, yeah, but I agree. Okay. Is there any more administrative inquiries? So moving on to 13, is there any notice of motion for council? And 14.1 then, we're gonna move into a closed session with council CAO dialogue. Is that correct? Yes, just need a So I need a motion, Councillor Phillips. I'll make the motion that we go into closed session. All in favor? Aye. 